Hi, everyone. Welcome to BookFest Spring 2021. This is the editing panel, How to Work Successfully with a Book Editor. I want to thank Desiree Duffy for scheduling us at the top of Sunday's programming because deciding which editor to work with is one of the most important decisions you're going to make. You want to find somebody who gets what you want to do with your book and appreciates it, someone who you're will get along with and communicates, and someone who can work at the editing level your book requires. And I'm gonna talk about different types of editing. Today, you're gonna to meet all these wonderful editors and they're gonna talk about how they work with their clients. So you can educate yourself and you're doing the right thing by being here. Everyone's going to talk about how they work with their clients. I'm gonna give you a little snapshot of who I am. I have been editing for 30 years. I started as the editor of the, at the time it was called the PMA Newsletter. Now they're the Independent Book Publishers Association. And I was their editor for about 10 years. I started with copy editing. Uh, about six or seven years in, I got an opportunity to start ghostwriting. I've ghostwritten about 10 nonfiction books. And at this point, 30 years down the line, I mostly work on self-help or memoir, and I do developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, proofing. I also am a book coach. I work with clients uh, on projects that are in process, and I meet regularly with clients, say, every week or every two weeks, and so they have an accountability partner. They need to get some work done before they talk to me again. I also help people reaching out to agents or self-publishing. So that's Robin Quinn in a nutshell. So let's look at the different types of editing. I'm going to go from the broadest type of editing to the most precise. And the broadest type of editing is called developmental editing. And here we're looking at the big picture. How is the book flowing? Is your approach right? Your tone? And um, I do this with a manuscript evaluation and notes in the file. Now, if your book needs more have a close look, then we get to substantive editing. And here the editor's looking at the overall flow, but also the flow of the individual chapters, the transitions. And this is similar to a developmental edit, but you're gonna get more input and more work, actual work on the file uh, by the editor. Now, when the overall structure is working, we get to line editing. And here we're looking at the flow of the individual sentences and the paragraphs. And once I was called in to do a line edit on a self-help book, it was a ghostwritten book, and the client felt that it was too serious and it would scare people off from trying their technique. So I was brought in to put a lighter, more encouraging voice over what was written. So that's the line edit. Now, copy editing, that's where I started. And copy editing looks at grammar, punctuation, um, spelling, uh, clarity, uh, accuracy, and also consistency. And um, copy editors also work with a style guide. In the book business, it's usually the Chicago manual style. And this tells us things like when to capitalize words and when to use numerals or actually uh, spell out numbers and the formatting for footnotes and the bibliography and that kind of thing. So finally, your book is in pretty good shape. It's almost ready to go, and we get it proofread. And here we're looking for, hopefully, actual errors in spelling, grammar, punctuation. And there might be parts of the book that were rewritten to answer queries from an earlier editor, so the proofreader can look at those as well. And you want to have your book proofread before it's laid out and afterwards. And you want to try to catch the errors before it goes to typesetting, because it's a lot more expensive to get it changed by the typesetter than it is by you. Uh, so the book um, goes through, if it needs it, um, we have developmental editing, we have substantive editing, we have line editing, we have copy editing, and we have proofreading. So um, I'm sure we'll hear more, and we might hear some other terms used, but those are the basics. So before we dawdle any longer, I'm going to introduce our first editor. This is someone I've known, He's he's worked for me. He is an author himself. His name is Gerald Everett Jones. And uh, his books include the award-winning Evan Wycliffe Mystery Series and a new literary novel, Harry Harambee's Kenyan Sundowner, which will be released on June 29th. Some of his editing credits include Developmental Editor, 
BMW 5 Series M Car Coffee Table Book, Developmental Editor, Edgar Scott's 418, I'm a teapot. It was a futuristic dystopian tale. Editor of the memoir, Prime Rib and Boxcars, Whatever Happened to Victoria Station. Gerald, take it away. Why, thank you, Robin. Yeah, truth in advertising. I've hired Robin. Robin's hired me. <laughs> We've known each other for uh, maybe longer than we would care to admit. Um, I actually began my professional writing career as a business and technical writer. And for about 20 years, I I had a, a, a very respectable agent and uh, I had contracts with uh, mainstream publishing companies. And I dealt regularly with their in-house editors. And I, I worked for some tyrants and I worked for some pushovers and I learned from both of them. And then um, as I got uh, along in my career, um, I started turning more to writing fiction myself. And at that point, my agent of many years refused to take my work out. And so I began to develop my own uh, small press and self-publishing, and I have published 11 of my own novels, and the one that's coming out in June will be the, my 11th. Um, I've also uh, worked as a developmental editor and ghostwriter for other novelists. And um, so I will say that there is a major difference between working in fiction and working in nonfiction. And where I can usually help most in nonfiction is if somebody is an expert or professional writing a book that is essentially their calling card. What we usually want to do is develop a book proposal, uh, an outline in two sample chapters and perhaps a preliminary marketing plan that's going to get sent to agents and publishers if you don't already have an agent or a publisher. And that's how nonfiction is usually developed, is you don't write the whole book before you pitch it. Um, fiction is exactly the opposite. Um, if, if you're submitting fiction to an agent or a publisher, you must have the whole manuscript done. And um, often I will get queries from authors who say, well, I got these notes and I, I'd just like you to write the rest. <laughs> And my question is, are you an author or are you a publisher? Because if you're an author, why would you have somebody else write for you? If, if you're a publisher, then my, my finishing the book, it's like, okay, here, here's what I have to say about that. I feel as though authors should regard their books, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, as self-expression as the best you can possibly do and the deepest you can possibly go. Um, authors should not, from when you're in manuscript development, authors should not regard their work as a product. Forget about the demographics, forget about the genre, forget about all everything. F focus on what it is uh, that made you write this, go as deep as you possibly can into yourself, be the best professional you can be, be the best memoirist you can be, be the best storyteller you can be. Then leave it to uh, pe people like me and, and agents and publishers and publicists to put on the other hat and tell you what works or what doesn't with this book as a product. But this is only after you've, you, you've, you've put it out there because otherwise, Beginning your book as a, uh, from a standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, even though it's good to have a marketing plan in the beginning, your book is going to look like everybody else's. It, it's likely to be vanilla. And we want to know, I think the book marketplace wants to know, what's special about you? What is it that, that you have to tell us that, that really has never been quite spun that way before? So that would be, that would be my strong urging, would be, please, please, you're an artist. You know, don't don't listen to other folks. And I, I'll just conclude my remarks by saying I regard as an author, I regard development notes uh, as uh, neckties. OK, when somebody comes to my birthday party and they don't know what I want, they usually buy me a necktie. OK, who gets to decide which ones to wear? Some of those don't go with me <laughs> at all. <laughs> Some of them I put in the back of my closet and I might. 
I might buy something someday that, that they'll match or go with. And others, I'm just going to re-gift. <laughs> you, know, no, you know, recycle. Um, so that's, that's, that's my wisdom. So, uh, so those are my two cents, Robin. Thank you, Gerald. Yes, I think that when you get your notes back from an editor, you review them and you see which ones ring true for you and which ones don't. And I always give my feedback initially in writing so the client can digest it. And that way they aren't on the defensive. So thank you very much, Gerald. Our second panelist this morning is Deanna Brady. She's an editor who I did a panel with for the uh, Greater Los Angeles Writer Society, uh, which is a book fest sponsor. I've heard a lot of really wonderful things about her work. She has had a decades long career as a writer and editor of both fiction and nonfiction. She has won awards for her own writing, but spends most of her time assisting other authors on every level of editing, including copy line, substantive and content editing, rewriting, ghostwriting, as well as researching, coaching, and book and script doctoring. She has edited nearly every category, and she has specialized in speculative YA romance, women's fiction, a lot of things, historical and creative nonfiction, as well as spirituality, ecology, indigenous cultures, psychology, and complementary medicine. Deanna, tell us more about yourself and your work with your clients. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm really honored to be in such illustrious company on this panel. And I'm very grateful to have been invited to participate in such a wonderful event. I think this is terrific. And all authors need this kind of information because a lot of them are completely stumped when it comes to trying to figure out who to go to to edit their work and how to find them, you know. And I always say that something like this is a great place to find such a person. Um, I, uh, Robin gave me such a wonderful introduction and I had some notes about the things I was gonna talk about in regard to my career and she covered so much of it. <laughs> I don't know what else I can say except that I started out helping my friends with school papers and never stopped editing. And I also write both fiction and nonfiction, for which I've won some awards, but I spend most of my time editing on every level, uh, including coaching and development and copy and line editing and substantive and stylistic editing and rewriting and book doctoring and researching and ghostwriting and manuscript evaluation and everything that Robin already covered. And I've edited just about every category of work. Um, she mentioned all the n numerous genres that I've covered, uh, work with, and um, I also work with a lot of different categories of written material, screenplays, biographies and memoirs, poetry, self-help, how-to textbooks, manuals, and marketing pieces that include query letters, book proposals, and web content, and social network media, uh, things that you need to promote your book once you've nailed it down and put it to bed. Um, and you want to sell it or market it. And um, uh, my nonfiction clients have ranged from professionals and small businesses to major corporations. But most of the time, I'm, I've been editing books, uh, especially re recently. Previously, I worked as a journalist. I've edited two, I've been the editor of two international magazines. I've also written and edited numerous children's textbooks and have written grant proposals that have actually brought in nearly half a million dollars for nonprofit groups. And I'm really proud of those achievements. How um, exciting. Yeah, very. And I also have a, a, quite an extensive professional background, literally from birth, in the entertainment industry, which I know Gerald also, I think, has. Uh, and I'm a voting member of several awards organizations. So I usually spend about half the year in total time crunch, trying to complete all my literary work while also watching literally every feature film and television show and competition, which is a, a whole unpaid job in its of its own. So that's a lot about me. About working with a, on a novel, like typically what kind of input you might have on a novel? Uh, well, um, I, I wrote notes about uh, what kinds of, when you say what type of input I might have, I'm not precisely sure what you're how you work asking. with a, a novelist uh normally i would 
have conversations first, either uh, on the phone or in person or by email or in some other form, uh, asking the author what they intend, you know, with their book, what they want to do with it, uh, whom they want to reach with it, um, what they intend to achieve by writing it, and It'll, of course, a lot will depend upon what kind of work they want, whether they want, you know, a, a simple copy editor or whether they want, they want me to ghostwrite the book for them. Um, and I ask them to give me at least if they have a, a full manuscript or if they have a couple of chapters and some other material, ask them to give me a full working synopsis. Uh, that has the beginning, middle, and end, and doesn't uh, hold back anything or keep any secrets. That tells me all about the main characters and you know how they relate to one another, and also give me uh, either the first chapter or several pages at least of, of the beginning of the book, so that I can see you know what the inciting incident is, if it's fiction, or how they uh, introduce the subject if it's nonfiction, and. I want to know what their background is, of course, if it's nonfiction, I want to know, are they an expert in the subject or why are they writing the book? So I probably ask them uh, a lot of the same questions that an agent might uh, if they're writing nonfiction. If they're writing fiction, I just want to have a heart to heart with them and find out, you know, uh, look at the material and find out what they're trying to express emotionally with the material and what they're trying to, to uh, um, engender intellectually and emotionally in their readers. Do you do manuscript evaluations? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Although I often advise people not to spend the money on a manuscript evaluation if they've already written a manuscript but they've only written one draft, I advise them to put that away for a few weeks get come back to it fresh and then start from the beginning and write another draft there are a lot of um inexperienced less experienced authors or new authors who somehow feel that they should start at word one and end at word one hundred thousand, and they've got a book and they don't understand that a book is all about revising rewriting uh crafting paring down you know just uh just eliminating chaff and, and getting down to the juiciest bits. And so um, I, uh, I always ask them to, give, to uh, make sure that they've written several drafts before they give it to me. Now I've lost the thread and I can't remember what your question was. It started me off on that. No, I, I think you've done great. Anything you want to add, we can wrap, you can wrap up. You'll have more uh, chance to talk later. I can't think of it, but when, when we get into some other subjects, I'm sure I'll think of 50 other things I want to say. <laughs> okay. I'm so glad you're here, Deanna. Thank you. Thank, so you. Thank you. Sure. Our third editor panelist this morning is Monica Faulkner. She offers guidance and support in every phase of writing and editing, from initial analyses or evaluations of your manuscript, through developmental editing, one-on-one -on -one coaching if necessary, copy editing and proofreading. UCLA, UCLA graduate and former journalist, she worked for newspapers on the East Coast and in Beijing, China, and Hong Kong before returning to the States to her hometown of Los Angeles and establishing her company, Faulkner Editorial Services. Recent projects include the memoir, Out of the Fields, the YA Trilogy, The Photo Traveler, and the business book, Unlock the Sales Game. Let's hear how editor Monica Faulkner works with her clients. Monica, take it away. You need to unmute yourself. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, it's just so interesting to hear how everyone is approaching their work and the similarities and the differences. Um, my basic approach is that if someone hears about me online or after a conference or something like that, my first question to them is basically, almost always, what do you want to have happen? Um, because everyone has that, they're, they're doing a book for a reason. And uh, the first thing I wanna know is what, what brought them to this? What are they hoping for? And I get an immediate sense of what their expectations might be, how much they know about 
the book world, you know, and all of that. And um, after I will usually talk with the person for as long as it feels necessary for us to figure out whether uh, I'd be the right person to help them. And I'm very, very happy to do a manuscript. I'm, I'm very, very happy to do initial reads of a person's work because I need to know, I need to, I, I want to see the whole thing. I'll do a, um, I'll do a, a manuscript evaluation and usually have a phone consultation of an hour or so discussing with them with examples about uh, structural issues, writing issues, um, anything that, that is a problem for me based on uh, the 30 years I've been doing this. So, um, I, and one of the things I, I do is talk with them about, uh, you know, what, what the world out there is like. Um, with, uh, actually, I, I do a lot of work with, I've done a lot of nonfiction books as well, um, and business books and self-help books and psychology books and all kinds of spirituality books. But um, I've, I've recently come, and, and you know, there's, with with nonfiction books, you write a proposal, which is which forces the writer to, um, if they haven't done this already, if they're going at it cold and they're working on a nonfiction book, it gives them a structure to work with, that is a structure that will help them do the work necessary to make the book work, but also to prepare them to go into the marketplace down the road. So it's it's a blueprint for creating um, both the creative for working on both the creative aspect and the business aspect of what they're hoping to accomplish. Um, in the last year or so, I've started actually um, advising fiction writers to do something along the lines of a quasi proposal because they can have trouble structuring structuring how the book is working um, and they can have trouble being in a world of their own about um, what the market is like. What's out there already, you know, where what is going to happen when you when you take it out there? And I think it's a useful exercise for them to be thinking more broadly, uh, certainly keeping in mind what their dream is and the story they want to tell, but uh, thinking not just in terms of one book, but also in terms of a career. Will this be a series? Will you, you know, will you, uh, how are you going to develop this and move on in your creative life? I love working with with writers on their um, on their actual manuscripts, and I do. Aside from you know the initial discussions, I do every level of um, editing from developmental, which can be very complicated and involve a uh, real total restructuring of a book to make it work. Um, and I have a few resources that I refer people to. Uh, books that I find are very helpful for pe to give fiction writers a, gr uh, a, a grip on how to structure a story. Um, I, I worked with, um, when I was, a long time ago, I worked with someone who really taught me a lot about story. And he was my role model and my mentor. So I, I try to apply those ideas and, and uh, work with people very closely. I also do, um, uh, I also work with uh, for people who are self-publishing. Uh, I also make contact with agents who I've worked with when I have something that I feel they might be interested in. Very happy to pick up the phone and talk with the agents I know if it's something I think they might like. And um, I also work with people on actually, uh, I work with designers who will do des really professional level designs for people who want to self-publish, particularly in nonfiction. I have a little team of people I really respect who help me with that kind of, you know, that stage of it. Um, it's more difficult. I, and, and then I also have referrals for marketing and promotion. So I'm interested in helping them in any way they can to, to uh, based on the resources I have and the resources I keep hearing about, to help them move forward through the full range of what they're trying to do as writers. But it always starts with, for me, the question of what do you want to have happen, and then we can go from there, and to pull pull that from them, so I have a sense of how I can help them. 
Thank you, Monica. I love working with great designers, and I can't tell you how many times I've shown people books that were self-published, and they were just astounded at how beautiful and well-produced yeah. they were. Yeah. This looks like a regular book from a bookstore. Well, of course, <laughs> we made the effort to do that and make it look that way. All right. So our Fourth and final panelist is Flo Selfin, someone who I've known for many years. She was president of the Independent Writers of Southern California for 13 years. We thought she was going to be president forever, but finally uh, <laughs> she did get a life and uh, outside of ayahuasca. Um, she has been copy editing and proofreading for 15 years, but says she's been a reader her whole life. And she's worked on award-winning books in many genres, plus scripts, business materials, and websites. Her copy editing projects have included Victory with Valor, which is fiction, Krishnamurti in America, which is a biography, Manson Exposed, which is nonfiction true crime. Flo also conducts lively grammar punctuation review workshops for adults. She is a PR consultant for books, authors, and arts events. Let's turn the mic over to Flo Selfman. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you today. Uh, when my sister and I were kids back in Ohio, and we'd go to m mother and say, Mommy, we're bored. She'd say, boredom is a sickness. Find something to do. Read a book. Now, we didn't have a television at home until I was seven years old, and I had already been reading for a couple of years. As time passed, my mother would say, oh, you should read this book. It's a classic. And I, of course, would turn up my nose because my mother was recommending it and I didn't want to read a classic. And you can guess the rest of that story. I'd come back a couple of months later and say, Mom, we're reading this wonderful book in class. And she'd say, guess what, child? It's a classic. So reading... Uh, when I actually got into the working world, I had no idea what I was going to do. I was a psych major, which was sort of a compromise between medicine, thank God I didn't go into that, and and being a school teacher, which I did end up uh, uh, achieving a, a, a teaching credential. But I got sidetracked into the world of entertainment and then from there into public relations. And so I really have had a long career as a publicist. I tell you this because. It requires so much reading and so much writing. And I had no idea what it was when I went into it, except that you got to sit in green rooms, those wonderful places which are never green, while your client is taping a TV show. And you got to meet fantastic people and have great snacks and maybe a glass of wine. And that's where I discovered, um, that's where I discovered uh, how much I love doing publicity, but it is a very stressful thing. And especially when it got mechanized and you had all this, the not even the 24 hour news cycle, it's the second by second and the pressure just really got to me. So I, I someone approached me. Um, it was a graphic designer who was also a fine artist, but he was doing uh, beautiful brochures and publications for a manufacturing company based in Europe. And they were doing a, uh, a tech manual and he had convinced them that they needed to hire a proofreader and it should be somebody who was knew nothing about the business they were in. I mean, they were doing things like O-rings that helped the uh, modules stay into in the in the sky and you know all this very technical stuff and I said I said I know nothing about this and he said well you know give it a try and I said well if it's written in English uh, I'll give it a try send me a few pages so he sent me several pages and I knew no nothing about what they were talking about I mean there were all these words like carbofluoro carbon things and huge things but you know I broke them down and the sentences made sense or they didn't and so I did that and he sent me this thing which was 225 pages I should also say I was going through a period this is 15 years ago where I was having um, some ear thing that was making me dizzy and I got this 225 page manuscript by the way on paper on paper and I was doing fine until I got to the middle and in the middle of this manuscript there were 70 pages of charts now one of my favorite book titles ever Gerald Jones is how to lie l-i-e with charts I love that book title I looked at these charts 
And I called the guy and I said, what am I supposed to do with this? They're just columns of numbers. He said, well, just look at them and see if you can find anything. Well, I looked at them. I see, I've been called everything from a professional nitpicker to an idiot savant. And frankly, I take it as a compliment. So I started looking at these columns of figures. And for example, there was a column of many figures and they were all six digits and a decimal point all in the same place. And then there was one number that stuck out because it was seven digits. The decimal point was in the same place. Okay, I flagged that one. Then there was another thing on the column headings. There was a, um, I don't know what it's called, but there was a, it's a letter with a little symbol above it. And I, and, and so I flagged that because it was missing in another place. And the other thing, I, and they thought I was an absolute genius, but I'll tell you the one that I caught that made me think I'm an absolute genius. On the back cover of this manual, which was the size of a large city telephone book, I have to tell you, uh, there was a map of the world with uh dots of where all of their branches were. And one of them was in a city in Mexico called Coretaro. And there is an accent over that and it was missing. And I said, that is what you don't want to have missing on your book cover. So that they, they, they were not as impressed with that as I was, frankly. Okay, from there, uh, I actually worked with these people for, I don't know how many years, until a few years ago. And and the stuff would be written in German and then it would get translated. And then the graphic designer who was as good in English as any of us would go through it. And then I would finally get to the end. So uh, they started doing it all in house. And so uh, I didn't have that client anymore, but it just went on for years and years and years. And it was a wonderful uh, relationship. Um, as Robin mentioned, I work I work in all kinds of genres from, I mean, fiction, nonfiction, romance, tech, uh, true crime, stuff that I wouldn't read. I mean, this Manson book I did last year, I said, sure, I'll do it, but I'm only going to work on it in the morning because I'm not going to deal with Charles Manson at night. Okay. Um, I, I, I have one author who, for whom I've, I've done five or six books, and she writes light fantasy fiction, but she also writes, and she, she's a New York Times bestselling author. She also writes, um, I don't know what you'd call it, gay, urban, shapeshifter, fantasy thing. And she's a wonderful writer. And I wouldn't read this in a million years, but I love getting her books because she's a wonderful writer. And Can you wrap up in is, about a minute, Flo? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me show you something. See this? This is three books with a bunch of sticky notes. I don't look for this when I'm reading a book, but when I start reading a book and I see mistakes, I'm just compulsive enough to sit there with those little mini post-its and I flag them all. And what happens is it keeps me on my toes, but these are already books that have already been published. And what happens occasionally, which is really a bad thing, is when a book gets reviewed and the reviewer says, this is a good story, except the mistakes are very distracting. And this is something we really want to avoid. So um, I used to get books on paper, but what I'm getting now is one that I worked on that came in, in a PDF and it was a very long fiction book. It was a nightmare to work on for both the designer and for me. Um, the, the, um, uh, two, two uh, history and reference books that I worked with a publisher last year, uh, wonderful books, and they were on Google Docs, which was another experience. So like all of us, you know, I keep adding to, to my skill sets. And, um, and I must say that I, I love my clients and I love being trusted with their work. That's something that always is an absolute joy to me. I agree with you. I think that's one of the best parts of being an editor is working with the clients uh, and developing those relationships with them. Okay, we'll hear more from everybody as we transition now into some questions. What are some of your working with editors do's and don'ts? Who wants to jump in on that one? Well, I will. Um, the, the subject of money might come up. Um, do's and don'ts, you know, you make an arrangement with your editor, you know, editors have to pay rent. So, you know, pay as 
as uh, determined. And um, the other thing is, what one thing that I like to, that I like to do, and I guess as a copy as a copy editor and proofreader, um, you know, I'm often hired as a quote proofreader. But what people don't understand is what it entails. And so basically, I am a copy editor, I'm a line editor, and occasionally I'm even a developmental editor. I don't pitch myself that way, but sometimes it works out that way. But do what what the editor advises. You have to do that. You know, there was, I'll just tell you one very quick thing. I attended a seminar at UCLA many years ago on film, something about film. And Sheila Benson was the LA Times film critic at the time. And somebody said to her, do you have a lot of, uh, are you friends with a lot of producers and directors? And she said, no, absolutely not. Because one day I'm going to have to kill their baby. I've never forgotten that phrase, but you know, it's a collaborative thing. And so, you know, if you, if you get good advice, you really have to take it to heart, even though you love every word you've written. All right. Who else wants to jump in? Do's and don'ts. Deanna. I was going to say the same, essentially the same things that Flo said in different words, but do ask if the editor that you're interested in will do a sample edit or test edit before giving you an estimate. And do ask which document type and format he or she prefers. And do prepare a complete working synopsis to give your prospective editors along with the first chapter. Do be sure to have a written agreement. Most editors will offer you a standard one that they typically use uh, with their clients. And while working together on the project, don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, also, as Flo was saying, do remember that editors offer suggestions for changes. And as the author, you don't have to agree with them. Um, but stay open-minded, resist arguing with your editors because you're paying for their expertise and they're trying to make your work even better than it started out to be. Listen and think about their advice instead of just fighting for your own opinions. Don't be nearsighted and don't be afraid to kill your darlings, as the saying goes. Just save them in another file on your computer. You can always use them later on or in something else that you write. Thank you, Deanna. Any other comments on do's and don'ts? Say that I have often hired developmental editors myself on my own books to give me another person, both, both beta readers and developmental editors. <laughs> and uh, don't ask for beta readers to give you developmental edits because they you know that's, that's not where they're coming from. Uh, on a beta, for a beta reader, I want to, I want to know about logic gaps. I want to know about confusion. I want to know about, you know, where you put it down or, where, where where the plot thread might have gone astray. Uh, and, and these are things that developmental editors might give you, but but also uh, beta readers. But also I've had development notes where it's interesting, we're in Los Angeles and often there will be more of a Hollywood mindset than you would get out of a New York editor. Uh, it, especially agents here on the West Coast seem to be very concerned about, uh, you know, making money out of movie rights and that's perfectly fine. But, you know, there is a screenwriter's mindset and there is a storyteller's mindset or a literary mindset and they're, they're quite different. And I had one note uh, on, on a book that I was ghostwriting uh, from a developmental editor and what, what they wanted for the point of attack what I would call, you know, where we're going to open the book was actually the most shocking scene. And it's true that that scene had to go in the book somewhere. But the difference between a book and a movie, yes, as a movie, the audience probably isn't going to walk out. Uh, they're probably not going to shut off the set. Uh, but the people who come to the book, I, th I felt were looking for a more inspirational beginning or a more hopeful beginning. Uh, they didn't want to go in at the most dark, at the, 
at the darkest point. And I, 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 and yet getting that note really convinced me that where we had chosen for the point of attack was the right for the book. So, so that advice was worth it, but I went 180 degrees from it. Okay, any comments, Monica, on do's and don'ts? You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. No. Um, the do's and, oh, it's tricky. Um, I think it's important to um, do a job early on about managing people's expectations when they come to you with a book. Um, in terms of thinking not just about, I mean, taking the book as it is, taking it for what it is, and meshing that with kind of the world out there up to a point. You know, there are, there are books that come in, that come to me that are, uh, uh, you know, actually unintelligible. <laughs> and, you know, I can choose I, when I'm talking with someone, I can kind of tell how much of a grip they have on what they're trying to do. Um, but I'm I'm always willing to take a look at at some of what they've done before making a prejudgment after a phone conversation. Um, one of the hardest parts of my my work is the um, really um, uh, costs and pricing. Because, for example, I do do um, evaluation reads and, you know, if something comes in and I read it, I know exactly how long it's going to take me to read it and have a consultation with the writer about what, uh, you know, what I see as possibilities for it. Um, if it gets into structural editing and developmental editing and a lot of... Um, a lot of drafts and a lot of work. It's very, it's very hard to set a price on that that's fair to both me and to and to the author, because that those levels that level of work then becomes um, unpredictable. You know, it's so that that's something that I need to explain to the writer when we first begin working together. That, and yes, you need I to explore what their resources are and how much they're yeah, willing to invest and, and so you to have a sense of how much you can actually do yeah. and how much they can do themselves, you know? Right. And and after so many years of doing this, so what I have developed over the, what I do now is I have a very, very detailed letter of uh, agreement, which I worked with a lawyer on. And it's worked very well because um, I, in you know, after the initial things, I, I have a clause that talks about the first phase of the work will be um, a, a, an evaluation, which includes a reading and a, a meeting. And I can, you know, I can put a budget on that. And then, but then I say, you know, the other things can be kind of open-ended. What often happens, however, is that the evaluation read, I do this, I mean, I this is my big do, is to have a letter of agreement that spells out the closed-ended things that are predictable and the open-ended things that can be unpredictable. But in the meantime, what tends to happen is the writer um, gets a sense of how things are going to work, and we develop a relationship as the evaluation part goes on. So frequently, you know, they're happy to move forward. And um, I found that being very explicit about um, how that process has worked for me is really a, a very important thing that took me a long time to get to. But I think it's good for both me and the writer. So that's, you know, how, Thank try to you. have things clear at the outset, you know. Very good. Did you want to say something, Deanna? Yeah, I just needed to unmute. Um, that's why I do a really thorough sample editing, because I like to show the author what the book can become if I put in the level of necessary level of editing to make it into its best version that it can be. So I want them to see if it's going to need a lot of uh, of course, I can't always predict about development, but that's one reason I ask for a thorough working synopsis. So I can see the bones of the project. I can see the skeleton of the book and whether it holds together and will hold all the flesh on it without collapsing. 
And I, I do a sample edit as a test edit for myself to see what level, whether this needs just copy editing, whether it needs, you know, just careful line editing or whether it needs really substantial, substantive, stylistic editing, rewriting, or sometimes whether they really are going to need a ghostwriter. And I'll let them know this once I've done all this sampling, uh, what level I see is really going to let them end up with the kind of book that, they, that they're looking to be able to call their own at the end of this process. And I let them know what the costs of that will be. And if they if that's something they can't do, then we can talk about various other approaches um, and and how they can market the book if if I don't go to the most expensive option, you know. So that's the the process of determining the work that's going to go into making this book its best self is an, you know can be a, a very complex and uh, and and subtle process and uh, sometimes takes a lot of time and communicating back and forth before they know a what they can afford to have done and b what they want to have done and c what they need to have done in order to come up with what they're looking for thank you diana i think it's really important to get a sample edit if you're doing a line edit or a copy edit or even a proofread uh, from your editor because you want to see what they're going to do with your work and you want to see uh, how it will help and um, often I think uh, it's interesting when you're competing with other editors and you know they're, they're seeing you know they're seeing samples from various people and then they choose you it feels it feels good you know <laughs> you're doing your job I also annotate uh, I, I annotate my my sample editing very thoroughly so I give them a reason for every change I suggest, almost every change I suggest, they can extrapolate about some of them. But I tell them why I suggested all these marked changes. And then I give them a clean version, I give them a marked version with a lot of embedded commentary. So they can see how my mind is working and why I've made those changes. So that tends to be helpful too. What are some things authors can do to prepare their manuscript for an editor? I really like the Grammarly tool. It's not a substitute for a copy editor, but uh, and you've got to be careful about your settings because with Grammarly, you, um, which is you know a um, a mega spell grammar style checker, but you have to set the type. Initially, you have to set the type of book or manuscript or article that you're writing, and uh, whether it's um, casual, formal whatever. I mean, those settings really do matter. But one of the things that you really need to pay attention to is, well, number one, you're not going to accept every, everything that it flags. But also, um, you, you want to be aware that that tool over, tends to overpunctuate. At least that's my feeling. So on a, on a manuscript uh, length book, Grammarly will probably flag about 1,500 instances of something. So it's going to take you a day to go through it. But if you if you are consistent and you are careful with it, you're going to save you and your copy editor a lot of work, and it's going to look a lot more professional. I, I don't recommend it for your last pass. I don't recommend it instead of not hiring <laughs> Robin or Deanna. But I do recommend those kinds of tools because – um, they're getting better. They really are getting better. And it will save you a lot of work and embarrassment. Thank you, Gerald. Other comments, Flo? Uh, you, you know, I come into the process later and a lot of, by the time uh, an author has worked with a developmental or content editor, they really want to get the book quote out there and they want to skip that last step. Now, all of you can copy edit and proofread, but you probably don't. It's a lot of time and effort that you don't want to bother with. So that step that I come into um, should not be skipped. And I always do a sample edit because obviously it gives them an idea of how I work. And also it gives me an opportunity to establish uh, a tentative budget. 
because I can see more or less how long it's going to take me and I figure my time by the hour. One thing I do request, you know, all of us have had the experience of having our names, uh, you know, written in the acknowledgements. And there have been a couple of times where I've been very grateful that my name did not appear in the acknowledgements because things were changed or uh, added that I didn't have a chance to look at. So I try to make it very clear that I want to see everything, front cover, back cover, spine, all the front matter, photo captions, acknowledgements, table of contents, if there is one, uh, inter preface anything that there is in there and and I hope anyway that's 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 one of the best things and then there are a couple of little things just 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 grammar things and punctuation things you know it, it was very hard for me to stop leaving two spaces after a sentence at the end of a sentence and uh, after a, a colon and um you know, there there is a command you can you can change it, but I mean, I get manuscripts where they get two or three spaces uh, after after sentences and everything. So you know, okay, Flo, okay. Uh, we're running out of time, so let's just all give our websites. Mine is www.writingandediting.biz. Deanna, sorry, unmute, please. Sorry, you can find me among the folks at wordsmithwritingcoaches.com. Flo. WordsAlamo.com. Gerald? Gerald Everett Jones.com. I'm the only one. <laughs> Monica. Monica Faulkner.com. <laughs> Can I say thank you thing? everyone for joining us today. Let us know if we can help you and enjoy this wonderful day of bookish programming.